we had our first cool front blow in this morning and uh, it was a crisp 72 degrees here today what a beautiful day supposed to be back up in the 90s in a few days but uh, we like this little bit of fall weather when we get it seems like we have a uh, summer and winter down here i don't get much in between difference but uh if you guys have any questions tonight please type them in the questions bar i have jody with me tonight and she's going to be helping me answer those questions when guy and i do these together it's a little bit easier for us to help answer the questions as well so if by chance we have a question that uh, we don't get to, we certainly uh, will look through this stuff tomorrow and we'll try to reach out to you with the answer. So again, uh, look in the uh, questions box for that. Don't use the chat, anything like that. All right, we're getting close to time here. So we are going to uh, talk tonight about some clinical pearls. Um, you know, Guy and I started uh, Dental Sleep Solutions in DS3 uh, many years ago now. It's been eight or nine years ago. And, um, you know, we just try to help dentists implement sleep medicine in their practice and succeed at it. So uh, along the way, oh, I do anywhere from 50 to 100 dental devices a month out of my practice in San Antonio, um, which I just started last week. No, I'm kidding. I've been doing it 20 years. It's taken me a long time to build that up and a lot of hard work and sweat and tears along the way. So, um, you know, along the way, you make a few mistakes and you learn a few things. So we're going to talk about some of those things tonight. So uh, what are we going to talk about? Too tight, too loose. Um, jaws hurting or muscle, uh, maybe too far forward, and uh, should we advance it more? I think those are probably our most common questions that our member support expert, experts at uh, DS3 get on a daily basis. So we're going to touch on each one of these. There's so much information that uh, we decided to keep this to an hour. It's going to be a little bit difficult to do that, but I promise I can get through these pretty quickly. And we want to tease you a little bit. Uh, a couple of weeks from now, we'd like to uh, have you on with us again as well as we talk about uh, part two of the clinical pearls. Where we're going to get into adjunctive therapies and uh, things like combination therapy. Um, you know, how do you treat somebody that doesn't have any teeth on top? We get that question asked an awful lot. Uh, how many teeth do they have to have before you can make them a device and which one might work better when they only have a few teeth? We'll talk about a couple of little apps, uh, some that are worthless, uh, in my opinion, and some that work very well. We'll talk a little bit about uh, doing some um, dental devices over implants and then, you know, maybe touch on elastics and when you use them and, and um, you know, do we start people in them all the time or can they actually help? What happens when we do sleep studies with them and without them? You know, a couple of things like that. So should be good. Again, I'm Dr. Rich Drake. Uh, Dr. Guy Yatros had something come up that he could not make it. He is healthy otherwise and doing well as far as I know. Um, so again, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, DS3 is, is what Guy and I started. We call it the, the DS3 experience and that's our, our uh, mission statement. We're the most trusted, innovative, customer-focused provider of solutions in dental sleep medicine, period. That's what we do. If you are new to this, if you have been doing this a long time, there is uh, likely something that we can help you with. You certainly don't have to reinvent the wheel, so we can help you do that. Uh, we do courses quite a bit. Uh, we haven't released our 2018 schedule yet. Uh, some of these have already happened. Uh, we do have one coming up in California, one in uh, Dallas. Uh, we're doing some other things as well. So um, if you mention course in the question box, 
Uh, you get some money off. I think it's a hundred bucks off. Don't quote me on that. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but you do get something uh, off on that as well. I do want to give a shout out to our second uh, symposium last year in 2017. That was very well attended and very well uh, accepted. We try very hard to bring you information that is clinically relevant. Um, you know, I just came back a few months ago from the AADSM meeting, and I'm not dissing that meeting at all. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. Uh, we get to see a lot of people meet up with old friends. We get to learn uh, what's going on in the... Uh, I think more the academic arena than we do other things. And that's important. I think you should know some of that stuff. But we take a little bit different twist on that. So our symposium, you see the list of speakers there. That should be pretty good. You know, we're going to talk about a couple of different things. I've been spending some money and doing some stuff on marketing. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And we have a good list of people who can do that. So I uh, hope you can make that. That's in uh, Florida in February of 2018. We do have a great raid at the Hilton. Uh, it's hard to find a hotel in Florida these days, period, after the hurricane. But uh, I think we're going to gonna have a good meeting. So, again, DS3, what do we do? We help you screen, test, treat, and bill for patients, and we do that through education, coaching, software, and support. It's not just a software. Uh, if you're interested in a free, no cost, no obligation consultation with one of our member support experts, just type in consultation into the question thing, and we will somebody will reach out to you tomorrow. Give, give us a phone number, an email, something that we can call you with or contact you to talk to you about that stuff. So, all right, it's 7.05, that's five minutes, and uh, we're going to jump right in. So, Managing bilateral muscle and joint pain. Boy, we get this a lot. Uh, probably the biggest thing I would say is back up and slow down. You know, and when patients' jaws hurt, we kind of got to figure out, is it a muscle thing or a joint thing? So we, first of all, we got to figure that out. But, uh, you know, NSAIDs uh, certainly can help. Moist heat, uh, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, you know, you can take up to 800 milligrams a few times a day. Uh, meloxicam is another good one. That's what my rheumatologist prescribes me for my psoriatic arthritis. And I like that. It seems to work pretty well. Uh, moist heat, get a wash, uh, washcloth and kind of hold it under the uh, real warm water and then just kind of hold it on your, your jaws and your cheeks while you massage them like that. Um, we'll talk about some of these other things, muscle relaxants, physical therapy, vertical height, that kind of thing. So certainly one thing we can do with that as well is to add an anterior deprogrammer. So if we think about the entire NTI principle of what we do, uh, we can take somebody who is a severe bruxer and if we you know, how do we to determine that first of all? So we look at their teeth and their teeth are really worn down. Uh, that means they're a severe sleep bruxure. Not necessarily. You know, people do this during the day. Uh, some people do it at night, but twice as many people do it during the day as they do night. And then there is some crossover in between those two. So the best way I found to do that is simply, you know, palpate the masseters. And if they, they have these huge world-class type masseters, then they're going to tear that device up. So you either need to make it a little thicker, you need to use some kind of metal substructure in it, you need to do something like that. But another thing you can do is to add this deprogrammer. So it's really not that hard. You know, when you look at this, you can do these on dorsals, you can do them on herpst. Uh, you can't really add to a Norval, but it's very difficult to do that. You can do them on micro twos. There's a couple of different devices that you can do these on, and that's what you need. Pretty much, I would say most dentists have uh, ortho resin in their practice. You just take the upper, I prefer it on the upper, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Roughen it up a little bit on that thing, make you a nice little glob of uh, acrylic there, and then, uh, you know, get that wet and then put it on, go around the sides, do that. I like to take on the upper part of this because I don't want to get acrylic and monomer in there. I take some ortho wax and I kind of stuff it in there a little bit so that we don't get that stuff running over the side or something like that. It can get a little bit gooey. And, you know, put a, put a good size glob on there. You know, by the time you do this and you put it in the pressure pot, 
you know, it takes 15 minutes or, or so, you know, to do this. And if you don't have enough, then you got to start all over again. So remember, we're trying to disclude the posterior area from hitting so that they're not grinding on this so much. And this has a little bit to do with the bilateral pain. So when some people, we feel like it's a muscle issue and it's on both sides like that, if we back up a little bit, most of the time that takes the problem away. Can you just not wear your dental device for a little while? Yes, you can. Do you have to be careful about that? I think so. You know, if somebody's got an AHI of 120 and they desat into the 40s, you know, wear your CPAP that night. Um, I don't have CPAP. Well, then wear your dental device and quit complaining so much that your jaw hurts. I mean, you got to make a decision on that. And it's not always the best, but you, you got to use your brain, you know, as we say. So I use this uh, pressure pot in the middle here. If you already have one in your office, just, just use whatever you have. It doesn't make much difference. I think I paid about 300 bucks for that. Guy turned me on to that thing. Um, you know, you can get the pressure up to about 20, 30 uh, and leave it in there for about five minutes in warm water. Um, be careful tightening that screw down on the top. That lid will break. Um, next time you see me, ask me how I know that. So fill it with a little bit of warm water. Um, not hot. If your device has thermocryl in it, then certainly don't use hot. But you can use pretty warm water. Get the pressure up and set it for about five minutes. Pop it out. Trim it back a little bit so that you kind of get you know, the, roughly about what you want to do. So what are we checking for? It's hitting in the front here, but it's not hitting in the back. So is that hitting in the back? I don't know. That's pretty dang close, isn't it? So that goes back to make sure you got a pretty big glob of that stuff on there in the first place. Uh, one way to do that is simply have them bite down. You can even take a perio probe or something like that, and that will give you a, an idea where, where that's not hitting at all in the back, how much you need to add in the front. Then you're going to check the bite. So you can see here on the bottom left picture, these are guy slides, I think, when he did this the other day. And you want the, you know, the lower teeth hitting evenly. That doesn't look too good, so we're going to grind that a little bit, you know, till we get it a little bit more even, something like that. And then we don't want the back hitting. So when we put that thing in there, you know, if it, it can mark a tiny little bit, but it certainly shouldn't drag at all when we do that. So that is a little clinical tip for adding an anterior deprogrammer to help with the muscle issue more than it is joint. However, it does help with some joint issues. You're certainly changing the fulcrum point for where the lower jaw hits the upper as it comes up. And that can make a big difference. So back up and slow down for bilateral joint pain, moist heat, NSAIDs, uh, anterior deprogrammer. Now, if I get somebody who's really, really bad and we're still having issues, my next step here is to take the bottom device and I actually cut a hole in it so that the lower, the upper discluding element is actually hitting the lower teeth themselves now. So uh, that really acts like an NTI. So I think this gets rid of some of the firing of the masseters. But, you know, I think they say with a true NTI type device, you're getting 80% of those masseters um, locked out from firing. So uh, cutting the hole in the bottom would be the last uh, option on this type of thing, but you can do it. So. And if you got a guy that's like that and you know that from the start, um, order it with a deprogrammer. Pretty much all of these labs will do it. Here is a deprogrammer built into a Herps device. So yeah, we, we can talk to your lab people, make sure that they understand what it is you want when you do that. Um, you know, keep it smaller, a little bit smaller, because you know, a lot of times, um, I'm, I'm real, real big on nasal patency. And if people cannot breathe through their nose, then I don't use a tap device as often, for example, because the adjustments right here in the center, I move it to the sides. So the bigger the tongue, the more vertical I'll add, the less they can breathe through their nose, um, I might add a little bit more vertical, but I certainly want an anterior opening. So if I, if I need an anterior opening with a dental device, then I have to be careful about how big I make my, my uh, anterior discluder. So 
it's not black and white. There's a little bit of gray there. You got to use your brain, you know, as we like to say when you do that. Um, we mentioned uh, muscle relaxants as well. I probably use Flexural the most, but uh, I think it's the cheapest. You can also use the Rabaxin or the Soma. You see the uh, generic names for them as well. I would make yourself a little cheat sheet with these things. Um, if you would like, you can um, just put that into the questions as well, and we'll send you a, a piece of paper with that on it or something like that. You know, I keep this in my top drawer in my desk there. I probably don't prescribe these things more than once every couple of weeks, and I'm seeing a lot of sleep patients. So you shouldn't be doing this a whole lot. Remember, they're very short term. We kind of want to get people over the hump. So, you know, sometimes if people come in a week or two, they're like, oh my gosh, my jaw is killing me. Take some time off. Don't wear it. Do some of the other things we talked about. Back it up a little bit and then start again. And many times, the second time they start, they don't have any issues at all. They don't have any problems at all. They do just fine. So remember not, to, you know, not to give up too, too quickly either. I think that's probably a very good clinical pearl as well um, because we do lose patients occasionally uh, to our treatment. Sometimes it's because they just don't want to wear it. Sometimes it's for issues that we could actually do something about. So uh, other NSAIDs, I guess we spelt that one wrong there. So NCIs, um, the meloxicam I mentioned before as well as the uh, ibuprofen. There's a couple other ones out there. Uh, many of your um, arthritis patients will already be on one of these. So you get somebody with uh, rheumatoid arthritis or fibromyalgia, and then they're having joint pain. So be careful about not getting too much of this into their system. So we're trying to figure out, you know, if it hurts, where does it hurt? The right side, the left side, you know, put your finger where it hurts, you know. So it's almost always a muscle uh, issue. Okay, um, when we make taps a lot, so I'm going to show you how to tripod a tap device. So the tap device itself, look at that picture. So we've got the uh, plate that has the hook on it, and, and then that's going to connect to the bar. And when we look at that thing, sometimes it only hits in the front. So sometimes uh, when it's made, that's the way we want it. We only want that plate hitting the anterior area. We don't want the backs hitting at all. So with a tap, because that hits in the front, sometimes, especially if you get a patient that wants to sleep on their side and they get their hands up underneath, they'll take their jaw and it will torque their jaw a little bit like that, you know, if they get their hands. So number one, um, get a, get one of the real fluffy little small pillows and try to put that between your hands and that. That will help sometimes tremendously, number one. Number two, um, the jaw that hurts, sometimes that will be a unilateral joint pain. So remember that the jaw that's hurting in a unilateral uh, situation, I always say the side that's hitting is the side that's hurting. So if they're in a dorsal device, for example, and the right joint is, is hurting, check it with your paper to make sure that it's only hitting on that side. Uh, and then even them up. So it's it, when it's in a unilateral position, the side that's hitting is the side that's hurting. And the other thing that uh, I've noticed nine times out of 10 is sometimes you take the right side if it's the right side that's hurting and you move it out a little bit more. So we always want to pay attention to midlines and things like that. But with the tap, we're back on the tap now. So we're going to basically add a piece of acrylic to the posterior area on the right and the left. So we're going to roughen it up. We're going to put a little bit on there. We're going to put some Vaseline on the, on the opposing arch. And then we very carefully put those things in there and we have them move around a little bit. So you want to make sure you have enough. Again, you don't want to do this twice. A little bit squeezes out. That's fine. We don't have any problem. Don't forget the Vaseline. You don't want that thing sticking to the, to the opposing arch. And then do the same thing where you put it in a pressure pot. So we do that. We stick it in the pressure pot. And now we've bingo. So we call that tripody. It's now hitting in the front. 
it's hitting in the posterior right and the posterior left all at exactly the same time. That really seems to get a lot of people who are in a tap and they're having either one side or both sides hurting a little bit. That really seems to get them over the hump. I'm not exactly sure why, but it really does seem to help. So another little trick for you there. Uh, remember that as you adjust the tap more forward, this angle may change a little bit and you might have to adjust that at some point in the future. So how far is too far? Man, this guy came in and he was such a motivated patient. I mean, you know, every week for <laughs> it seemed like a year, man, we were cutting that plate off and moving it. He can move his jaw about 12 millimeters a day we started, and our final treatment position on this guy was 27 millimeters. So I would rec not rec recommend that. You know, certainly if you don't have to, we only want to go as far forward as we need to to, you know, relieve subjective symptoms and snoring and then at least do a titration sleep study at that point to make sure that we're treating them uh, effectively before we, you know, titrate any further. But so sometimes we need to go farther. Sometimes we need to back up. <clears throat> Most of the time going forward is pretty simple. With a SUOD, for example, we would just add shims here. Uh, the red, black, they actually come in stainless steel as well. But sometimes we got to back a device up. So rather than send this SUOD back to the lab and have them move these, uh, the ends of that bar, you know, just, just throw the uh, perio probe on that, make a little mark with a disc. You know, you want to move it back three millimeters, and then you take a separating disc, and you separate that thing in two. Kind of smooth up the edges on there, and bingo. You know, you, you back your device up three millimeters uh, just by doing that or two or whatever it is you want to do. So that's a quick little tip for doing that. So for backing it up. So there you have it um, for managing TMJ and muscle pain. Certainly that is not all inclusive, but those few tips that we talked about there should uh, really help you get the majority of your patients who are having issues over the hump. And, and I think if I could add one to that, it would simply be time. You know, sometimes it just takes a little bit of time. Um, the, the analogy that I use with all of my patients is this is the first lap of a marathon and uh, it's, it's not a race, you know, it's not a sprint. So we want to do that a little bit. So, all right, how are we doing on our questions? Everything's going okay there. So we're moving right along. We're making good time here. So, um, Go back to that. You know, sometimes instead of backing up, we need to take a device and advance it further. So I do this a lot in my practice, and the reason I do it a lot is because I'm very conservative in where I start patients. Um, if somebody can move 10 millimeters, most of the time I'm starting them at three or four. So I, I believe that is a better way to do things. It does create a little bit more work sometimes in the long run because we do have to uh, maybe cut a plate off or do something or change something. So we're going to give you a couple little tips about how to do that. You know, a guy said his son the other day uh, made a comment when Michael Phelps was winning his 4,000th gold medal or whatever it was that, uh, look at his jaw. You know, he's sticking his jaw out, Dad. And I thought, yeah, well, maybe that what gives you that hundredth of a second, you know, difference by getting a little bit of air. So let's take a dorsal here and let's add some to the distal of the wing. So put the dorsal in, top, bottom, we take a bite registration material, we just gob a bunch of it in there and we tell them to bite down. So we take an index of that. So now we have an index of, of how the top and bottom relate to each other. So I like to see no space here on both sides, that tells me if I see a space there, then I didn't do that right. I need to cut that out and do it. If I keep seeing that, then I need to adjust the other side forward or this side back, 
one or the other. But one of the reasons we do this is because as this as this piece that's pushing on that lower fin goes out more and more and more and more, the torque arm gets longer and I put a lot more force on this area. So where we see dorsals fracture frequently is in this very back corner of the upper next to that jack screw. So as we get out there, you know, maybe we've got this lady out this far and we don't have any relief of her symptoms yet. So we're supposed to um, add a little bit more. So there are some variations of dorsals that, that solve some of these issues. Again, uh, you can work around some of this in other ways. Uh, and, and there's always a better way to do something. But I'm going to give you a couple of tips here about, you know, some things that we can do. So if I needed to move this out, I would take that index. I would now move the device back right? Four millimeters, whatever it is I want to do. I've got to get rid of a little bit of this extra bite material on there so that I can reseat the device back on there. So now I've got a very positive seat on there. I've moved the upper member back and I see that I've got a space here now. So now I'm going to add some acrylic to that particular part of that, okay? So again, roughing it up a little bit, um, got to have some Vaseline around. Then we're you know, going to put that on the top part. We actually put a little bit of um, ortho wax right in here as well because we want to be able to continue to do that. If some of that stuff leaks back in there somehow, you can kind of get that thing stuck and you don't want to do that. Again, put your glob of stuff on there. You build up the wing. So we're now looking at the opposite side. So we've taken that left wing, we've added some acrylic to it. Then we reseat that so we get a nice little edge on that thing right there. And, uh, you know, the other trick that we can do too, we typically take a piece of scotch tape and we put it on that outside corner and that keeps that outside edge at least very clean. So we do the other side, we do both sides, then we can remove our index, then we uh, put it in the pressure pot, then we get the burr out. So if you use the tape on the outside, it certainly cuts down on what you have to do on the outside. And now you've got a nice extended uh, wing on that. I've taken this part, I've moved it back. This is much less likely to break and I now have the ability to move that device forward quite a bit more. Pretty neat little trick. Okay, put it in, check it, make sure everything looks good. Here's another way to uh, move a herbst forward more. So remember these arms come in a couple of different lengths. I don't remember exactly what they are, but the longer we adjust this thing out. So if we start a guy at three out of 12, for example, which would be very conservative, we don't always do that, but let's say we move that thing out five, six millimeters, whatever the maximum is in that particular arm. Now I've got a whole lot of threads exposed here. And we had a guy come in the other day and he had snapped the thread part in two on both sides. Uh, that's not good, right? So we got to do something. So Great Lakes Ortho sells these sh shims, the Herp stainless steel tubing. You get 10 in a pack. They come in one, two, three, four, five millimeters. Uh, I think uh, we usually use the three. So now we can back that up. That's what it looks like. You want to cut that thing with a separating disc just like that, smooth up the edges. Uh, don't hold it in your fingers when you do that. It's very difficult to, uh, to hold on to that thing and not cut your finger or something like that, or half the time they go flying across the room and I can't ever find them again. So grab it with a little pair of needle nose or some kind of pliers and then you can trim it and you can do that. Then you simply pulled it over the male portion of that and then you crimp it down with a pair of pliers. Make sure you trim up the edges, that kind of thing. So make sure you, you, uh, you know, when you do anything with a herbst and acrylic, make sure you keep, you know, ortho wax in there or something like that. We're not using acrylic here, but that's one little tool that you can do that with. So again, we're talking about moving a device forward you know, um, if you go all the way back to the picture of the uh, guy in the tap that I had out there at 
you know, 14 inches or something like that with his jaw out that far. I had to cut that plate off and move it every time. So the new taps have solved a little bit of that problem because they now have three hooks on the system. So you have the base plate and then you have what we call the short, medium, and long. They call it standard class one, class two. Um, I think that's confusing. In my office, we just call them short, medium, and long. So you have quite a bit of range of motion when you when you consider these two different hooks. So here's an old TAP3 Elite. The principle is the same on all of these. So ex except it's upside down and backwards for the Dream Tap now. So the longer hook goes way back like that. And, and then we're going to show you how to change those hooks out. So there's your tap. You got your key that adjusts the device forward and back. That's what you give the patient. It comes with a separate hex key. It's a little smaller hex key, and then it comes with a couple of sets of hooks. We like a little spoon excavator, something like that. So you take the smaller hex key, not the black handled one, and that goes into the side screws. So we put that into the side screws, and then we back those screws out, and then we got to pop that front plate off. So sometimes there's a little piece of acrylic over the outside edge right there where my mouse is. You can see a little bit of it on the right side, and that's going to keep that front plate from popping out. So you got to be uh, careful when you do that and not mess up the threads or anything like that. So be careful if you use a handpiece. You can use uh, that spoon works good for that as well as uh, uh, scalpel works, uh, burr works, but you gotta be careful, don't mess that up. Now, so you were, we were looking at that from the front before, now we're looking at it from the top. You gotta just wedge a lab knife in there or a spoon or something like that, and now you can pop that front plate off. And then once you get that front plate off, the hook and the screw, center screw, slide out. It slides completely out. Then you just take your fingers and you unscrew that screw off the hook and you change the hook out, put it back in. I typically, um, because you can do this backwards, and I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't do it that way uh, more than once, because you can get this screw turned around. It will go in either side, um, just as it, go in one side just as easily as it will the other. So remember, and again, these are backwards from the, the Dream Tap and the, the uh, Tap 3 Elites are, are different because the, the plate on a Dream Tap is on the bottom and on the old taps, it's on the top. So just make sure that, you know, take a picture of it with your phone as you're sitting there, draw a picture of it, have an old one sitting there next to you so you don't get that thing messed up. Then you put the plate back on. You, you might have to trim a little bit of that to get it back on. Then you put the plate on, you put the screws in, you screw it down. Pretty simple. So I now have changed the range of motion. Oh gosh, five, six millimeters, whatever it is, when we go from short to medium, medium to long, that kind of thing. I like that idea of short, medium, and long as well. So the taps come with those. You have a bunch of those. Uh, we take a little fishing tackle box. Imagine that, since I'm a fisherman. And we put all our extra parts in there, that kind of stuff. So you can, you can just kind of organize them, keep them looking nice and easy to find. So uh, say we've got an older tap, or for some reason or other, we can't get the jaw into the position that we want using the parts that we have. As a last resort, this is what I used to do all the time, you can cut the entire plate off and move it. So I like to take a Sharpie and mark where it was before if I'm going to move it forward or back. This is what I did on the other guys that you saw. Then I take a separating disc, I come out about three or four millimeters and I kind of I don't know, about a 30 degree angle. You got to remember that that plate has a metal wing underneath it that that acrylic goes over. So you cut three sides of that, each side in the back. Then you can kind of pop that thing off. 
you can be a little bit aggressive with that. They're pretty pretty uh, robust. I don't think I've ever had one break. Um, make sure you cut most of it through though because you don't want to splinter this acrylic or something like that. Then we take this and we roughen it up a little bit, could have put a couple of uh, scores in there. We, we get our acrylic down there. You know, we could do this, for example, if we wanted to raise the vertical as well and something like that. Again, when we're working around this on the front part, I'll put um, ortho wax in there so we don't get uh, acrylic into those screws because they're very, very hard to get out if you do that, as well as the center screw. So we put a little bit of ortho uh, wax around that so that we don't do it. Now we can get that thing on. This particular guy, we were going to move forward. Remember, we can't see our mark too well back here, but it looks like we move that thing forward maybe three or four millimeters. Then I add my acrylic on each side on the back. Again, don't let it drip over into this center screw or those side screws because sometimes you need to get that thing off or you need to do something different. Put it in the pressure pot again for get it up to 30, 5, 10 minutes, then take it out and smooth it up. So that's it. One thing you got to be careful of when you put these things back on is the angle that that thing goes back on. So I would say this one is probably off a little bit. I think this top left corner needs to go forward just a little bit. The best way to do that and look at that is to quit looking at it like this, you know, um, put it down on a on a paper towel on the counter and back back up a pretty good ways oh wow that's off a little bit you know uh it's it's so much easier to see that when you're when you're back a ways and you look at that rather than when you're uh right up on top of it all right moving right along so let's talk a little bit now about what i think is probably the biggest challenge um, that we face in my office on a day-to-day -day basis is the device is too tight or it's too loose. So if a device is too tight, as a dentist, we're all pretty good at that. We just grind something off or we cut it off if it's thermocryl or we heat it up or we do something. So devices that are too tight within reason can usually be fixed pretty easily. You know, which tooth is it pushing on? Which way is it pushing? It's this tooth right here and it's pushing back. Okay, well now we know what we need to do. Take it out, grind on it a little bit. I'm probably a little more aggressive than most people because I only like to do it once, but uh, remember, for an all acrylic type of device, you can always add to it as well too, so. Uh, let's talk about this. Uh, adjusting class, uh, relining with acrylic, the old heat and squeeze <laughs> method sounds real scientific. We're going to have to come up with a different name for that. Um, the Hilliard pliers, for those of you who do a lot of Invisalign, you certainly already have those laying around your office. If not, you're going to learn about that, and we'll talk about it. So, And, and last, and, and certainly last but not least, would be to send it back to the lab. So um, I do not ever want to send a device back to the lab if I can help it. I will do everything in my power to get that thing to fit today so that the patient could go home with it or continue to use it or whatever it is. So uh, ball class, this is where your little spoon comes in handy. I don't know about you, but I think when I went through dental school, I think they made me buy about 75 different spoons. Um, those that I've not broken off fixing some kind of fishing lure or something I have laying around, that's what we used at the office. So you can wedge something in there and push that clasp out a little bit. I'm not a real big fan of ball clasps because they do put a wedge in between your teeth. Um, so you got to keep it in perspective. If you think about, I have a patient who has very, very short, very, very straight teeth, and they have very severe sleep apnea. I would rather put ball class in there so that I could get their dental device to stay in and I could help keep their airway open and keep them alive than I would be concerned about developing a space between their teeth. So I would rather they not get a space between their teeth. So I don't use ball class unless I absolutely have to. 
Um, I use Thermacryl. I use a lot of Thermacryl because we can get that pretty tight without ball class. But you can do that with ball class. You just kind of push on it a little bit. We can reline devices. So anything that is an all acrylic device or a bioacryl device, like an EMA. EMA, most EMAs are made out of either 2.0 or 2.5 bioacryl. Uh, EMAs will loosen up a little bit over time. Uh, I prefer to uh, use the pink uh, liquid when we do EMAs because it's a little bit easier to see, you know. So again, we just roughen that surface up. We uh, do the old you know, powder and liquid technique, you could mix some of that stuff up and pour it in and kind of, you know, roll it around a little bit. What you want is a nice, very thin layer on that device. You want to wait till it gets pretty, I would say, beyond even tacky. It's no longer tacky, but it's almost starting to set up. And then very carefully, you line it up as close as you can, and then you push on it very hard. So I want to get a very positive seat. At that point right there, please do not take a phone call. Um, hopefully, you don't have to go to the bathroom. Nothing like that, right? So let's try to make sure, uh, because those things can lock in. And again, the next time you see me, ask me how I know. It's no fun having to cut these things out of people's mouths. Uh, trust me on that. If you haven't done it, you don't want to do it. So let it set up beyond tacky. Put it in. Push on it as hard as you can. Have the patient hold it there for about 20 seconds. And then I tease it up about halfway, as straight up as I can. Push it back down. Wait 10, 15 seconds, tease it up a little more than halfway, push it back down, wait. There's a little bit of a learning curve here for what you want to do. So if that first time you try to get it off and you can't even hardly get it halfway up, then take it a little more than halfway. So again, once you do this a couple of times, you'll you'll do just fine with it. It's, it's really not that hard. Uh, what you do not want to do is have that stuff lock in, though. So if you look in there and somebody's got, you know, an old perio patients you've done surgery on and or they got a, you know, a, a high water bridge that G.V. Black himself did, you know, 120 years ago, uh, be really, really careful if you get that kind of stuff. So you can put some wax underneath it. You, you just got to be careful and use your brain, as I like to say. So the old heat and squeeze technique. Uh, most of you have some kind of a torch laying around. Those things don't cost that much money. You use hot water, you know, a torch. You look at that stuff, and then we're just going to squeeze the device. We can't really add anything to narvols. Um, does anybody really know what a narval is made out of? Um, it's white. I can tell you that. It's pretty cool stuff. It's flexible. Fantastic. Uh, dental devices, but they're very difficult to make tighter if they start out too loose. So you heat that thing up and uh, then you just kind of squeeze it together like that. You have to, I have to put my little cheater glasses on so I can see it and then we're going to squeeze a little bit. So if you squeeze too far, uh, you probably messed it up. So be careful. I'd rather heat it up a few times and squeeze a little bit, try that in. Oh, it's a little better. Okay. And again, after you do this a little while, uh, a few times, you'll, you'll get a little better feel for how you do it. Um, you got to be careful with the narvals. Um, they will catch on fire if you put that torch on them too long. Ask me how I know. I know that. So here your plier. Uh, those of you who do Invisalign know about these. Got a little plunger on one side and a hole on the other. Uh, I like the red one. I don't know if anybody knows particularly the model of that. I know it's just got a red tab on it. That's always the one that we get and recommend because the plunger is pretty small. So you heat up the plunger side. Uh, I like to, to take a Sharpie and put a mark exactly on the interproximal area that I want to put a little dimple on. And I'm going to push that. I put a little bit of Vaseline on that because it makes it work a little bit better. It doesn't stick as much. And then I put a little dimple on that. Uh, to go in the interproximal area. There you get to see the other side. Now, when I take that off, you can see where that plunger went in right here and right here. 
So sometimes you got to take a burr and maybe just a tiny little bit round off those corners. Again, you don't want this to be a wedge and stick in there and get their, you know, drive their teeth apart. Um, unless they got an old crown here that needs to be replaced anyway. And no, I'm kidding. You really don't want to do that. But, uh, you know, use your brain. That's another little trick. So there's a couple of ideas for you there, um, you know, on how to make them tighter. If the device is made out of acrylic, we just add more acrylic. You can't do the heat and squeeze on a device that's made out of acrylic. Actually, you can do it, and uh, it cracks if you if you squeeze hard enough. I can tell you that. Uh, Biocryl, you can heat and pinch. Uh, you can add acrylic to it. This might be an EMA. There's a couple of different ones sometimes. I've even seen taps made out of biocryl. Not many labs do that, but I have seen them before. Uh, the Hilliard plier. Remember, um, to another little trick we do sometimes with uh, EMAs is we take the stone model, even the plastic model. So we're, we're taking scans now for a few years and printing our models with 3D printers. We take a little tiny round burr and interproximally we just make a little divot there and then we put the EMA onto the model and then we pour really, really hot boiling water over it and then we squeeze the sides of the EMA and it pushes a little bit of that plastic into that little indentation that we made. That's another little trick you can do. So uh, Bruxy's material, I uh, have a question mark here. I love the uh, Bruxy's that, uh, you know, a couple of labs make the uh, couple of different devices out of the Bruxy's material. I love that stuff. Um, it's a little difficult to use to get retention uh, on short teeth again. So you got to have enough teeth to use the Bruxy's. But if they put a metal substructure in the Bruxy's, you can get the Bruxy's real hot. Sometimes you can't do it with your fingers. Sometimes you got to take a pair of pliers, but you can squeeze that as well. So same with the Suad. Uh, the comfort or the flex fit, depending on what the labs call it. I haven't figured out a way to make that one tighter yet. Uh, you certainly can't add anything to it. I did have a guy one time who was going on a cruise, and he was like, man, I am going to be thrown off the boat if I can't take this thing with me today. And it was so loose. The, you know, the, the lower fit fine, the upper would just fall out of his mouth. So what did we do? We ground out all of the flex material. Yeah, how long does that take? Well, it, it only took me about 10 seconds because I said, hey, Ashley, will you grind all this out? But it took her a long time to do it. And then once we got all that out, we lined it with acrylic and then we reseed it. So that, that's a way that you can do it, but that's an awful lot of work. So um, let me say anything else. We didn't talk a whole lot about uh, Thermacryl or AccuFit is what uh, Dynaflex Lab calls it. So I, I love Thermacryl. I'm a big Thermacryl user. You know, if you got some dental work that needs to be done, uh, let's wait till we get those four crowns done. You know, and it takes a patient a year to get the four crowns done, and then they're dead um, because you didn't treat their sleep apnea. So, yeah, people people need crowns, but we, we need to treat airways before we treat teeth most of the time, okay? So make them a dental device and simply put the uh, uh, thermocryl in, in the hot water, and then you can refit it like that. So it works really well. Um, if, what if we have to make a patient a different device? You know, how do we handle the money? Uh, that's a really good question. And that's a tough question, man, because, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I have a, a standard answer. I will tell you what I look at is, number one, do I like the guy? If, if he's a pain in the rear and I don't even like him, I don't care if he ever comes back or not, I'll probably charge him. Um, that's probably not real professional, but, um, you know, again, we, we got a few patients that give us problems and, uh, you know, we got we to gotta be reasonable. Is he on a fee schedule? Uh, how much did he pay for the device as we look at that kind of stuff? So... Um, 
think about those types of things, you know, as we do that. So, um, again, ask them maybe for some help with the lab fee, something like that. You know, if they'll pay a couple hundred bucks or something like that. You know, sometimes goodwill will go an awful long way. So if you say, you know, normally we charge people for this, but I, I understand, you know, your, your husband's having some health issues and stuff like that, and I certainly don't want to add to that burden. Um, we'll go ahead and do this at no cost to you. Um, and they'll say, oh, thank you so much, doctor. And we say, well, you know, you could certainly return the favor by uh, referring us a patient. So that can work very well sometimes as well too. So that's another thing you can try. So uh, we're doing real well on time here. So congratulations, you are now the expert. You know a couple of different things about how to do this. You know, as you think about how much time it takes the dentist to treat their patient. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to take that long if you have a system and you have a way to do this. So if you're screening your patient and your hygienists are screening them and then you decide to go into the hygiene room and say, hey, we need to get you a sleep test. And then you talk for 20 minutes about how they could do that. Your hygienist is going to get mad at you and your office manager is going to get mad and everybody's mad because you're running behind now. So have a system for how you help facilitate that test and do it. You know, what are you doing to, for insurance and all that other kind of stuff, impressions, exams deliver the device. It doesn't take that long. You know, it really doesn't, especially if you have a system. And the return on investment, if you're new and you're thinking about doing this, you know, make one device a month, you can add, you know, quite a bit to your bottom line. You know, if you, you add one device a week and you still pay for the lab fee and you pay DS3 if you decide you want to be a DS3 member, which I would say is a really good decision, and you pay the biller, um, you know, you're, man, you're making a bunch of money. So I, I don't think there's anything else out there that you can do that has a better return on investment. Um, not only from a monetary standpoint, but from a job satisfaction standpoint as well. You know, we always say keep the patient first and things don't get too far out of line. So if you're keeping the interest of the patient first and foremost, then you're going to get paid and things are going to work out and you're going to do well. So you got to have a plan. What's your plan? You know, if you're already doing this and you think you know everything, then I can't help you. If you're doing this and you're pretty sure you don't know everything, then uh, DS3 can help you, absolutely. We can make a system, we can put things, we can make them more efficient, we can help facilitate all of those steps along the way. So again, I know some of you are typing in there consultations, you're looking at that. So we have all kinds of cool stuff built into our software. You can get a, a free uh, demo anytime you want, you know, with that. So we're here to help you whenever and however we can. So the uh, two weeks from now, we're going to do uh, part two of this. We're going to talk about some other adjunctive therapies for increasing success. Let's say you have a patient uh, that's in a dorsal and you've moved them out about as far as you can and they've had a sleep test and we're still not treating them very well. What can we do? Well, I got a couple ideas that might surprise you and I think it will help you. So uh, we're going to talk and walk you through how to make a um, – a dental device on, on somebody that doesn't have any teeth on top and just a few teeth on the bottom. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of different apps and um, how we handle a couple other things. Uh, I am really getting into more and more of the combination therapy, so I'm going to talk quite a bit about that next time as well. So uh, if you've not subscribed to our Dental Sleep Insider magazine, a digital magazine, I would highly recommend you do. It is free. Uh, it's a lot of good reading, a lot of good implementation. We can embed videos in that. We can do all kinds of cool things. So, uh, good. Remember, the DS3 experience, we help you screen, test, treat, and bill through education, coaching, software, and support. Simply type consultation in there. And uh, we're glad to help you do that. So I am going to open up my question pane now. So we'll see what um, Jody's been able to answer and what we're doing. 
So people are talking about using a buffalo knife to get that plate off. I love that. That's what I actually use. As long as a buffalo knife is that one with the green handle, that's what you're talking about. So somebody asked a question about if just starting treatment, could you put them in an NTI and get them deprogrammed and then have them go back to the device? Certainly you could. Um, you know, I think you got to think about, again, the airway. How severe is their sleep apnea? Let's say a patient with an RDI of seven. They're just a little bit sleepy, but they got real, you know, TM joint issues. I would probably put that person in NTI first. And then I would put them in a dental device with an anterior deprogrammer. Yes, absolutely. Let's say the guy has an RDI of 97 and he desats to 43%. Would you put him in an NTI? Maybe if he's wearing CPAP. But if the guy says, look, I've tried CPAP for six months and there's no way I can wear it, it's absolutely impossible for me to wear, then I would put him in a dental device, you know, right away. So, again, use your brain. Uh, a couple of you people said, please send me the muscle relaxer script. We're happy to do that. Uh, everybody wants that list, man. You know how long it took me to make that? At least 20 minutes, but I'm happy to do that. What's the best procedure for titrating the sleep devices? So, um, Dr. Steinberg, you know, it's an imperfect system in what we do. You know, I would love to make a dental device, have the patient wear it for a week at a very conservative um, starting position, say 30, 40%, and then have them do a sleep test, adjust a millimeter wear it for a week, do another sleep test. So we can't do that. We do have the matrix system out there that's gaining a little bit of traction. For those of you not familiar with that, we take the <clears throat> kind of like, um, you know, heavy, medium heavy body impression material, and we make trays and we put it in a remote controlled uh, device that actually the patient wears during a sleep study and we figure out their best position. So we actually find their best position in the lab before we ever get started. Okay, da, 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 da. let me see if I got anything else in there. Narval issues with fit and retention. We think we we recognize we uh, we talked about that. Uh, Narval is too tight. We just grind on it. Um, if it's a little bit too loose, the heat and squeeze, uh, as well as the Hilliard plier. We talked about, so with titrating, I want to say one more thing about titrating devices. We start conservatively, and we titrate for the first three to four to five weeks at one half millimeter a week. So if it's a tap, it's two half turns. If it's a dorsal, it's five. If it's a herbst, it's eight, you know, something like that. So... The more you advance, the more slowly you have to do it. So if you think about it, I can move my jaw this far. The first third I do very quickly. The second third I have to slow down. By the time I get to the last third, um, I have to slow down even more. Okay. Any suggestions? Send patient back, home sleep test. She felt better. It was, it wasn't doing as well. O2 stats still too high. So, yeah, that's where we usually will move them out further. Sometimes we can add vertical. Sometimes we can add elastics over that. You know, we got to remember, sometimes our dental devices simply don't work, you know. Um, it's so hard for us as dentists to take that we can do something and it doesn't work, you know, because we're taught in school that we're going to we're going to do this and and, uh, you know, it works. So let's do the best we can. People talk about, well, Dr. Drake, do you do you guarantee this? It's a good question. I'll tell you what, Jim. I will guarantee you that I will do everything in my power to make this dental device fit, to make it comfortable, and to manage your side effects so that we can find the best treatment position. I will guarantee you that I will do that. If you guarantee me, you'll pay me everything you owe me. No, I'm kidding. We don't always say that the second part. Okay, please send me muscle list, muscle list. 
tap, tap, couple of questions on this. I hope I answered all of those. Uh, a couple people for consults. Muscle pain can be an indication to move more forward. Can you expand on that? It can be, you know. Uh, very few people start the patient uh, con as conservative as I do. So Somnomed, for example, they want you to take a bite at 75% of maximum protrusion. 75%. Man, you've gone too far half the time, in my opinion, if you do that. So when I ask Somnomed, well, why do you say that? They say because when we ask a dentist to send us a bite at 75%, they usually send it at 25% or something like that. So yeah, um, how far have they moved? So again, we use the Pro Gauge, uh, the George Gauge, it doesn't matter. There's a couple of different systems that you can use for vertical, that kind of thing, taking bites. And we document it. Patient, we took a bite at nine millimeters vertical and four out of 12 millimeters protrusive. Then we put them in a Herps device. We started the device at plus five or plus eight maybe which is a half millimeter. The patient comes back a month later, they've adjusted eight clicks four times. Where is the patient today? Well, we started them at four, then we added a half, that's 4.5. They did eight, 16, 24, 32, that's two more millimeters. Now it's, we're at 6.5 out of 12. I can tell you exactly where we are with most patients at any particular given time. Uh, let's see what else we have. How long you keep them in the D programmer? Can it be long term? Yes, it can. Absolutely, it can. Uh, can you grind the thing off? Uh, the D programmer? Yes, you can. You can grind that thing off and see how they do. Um, I would not do that if the patient's doing really well. So, you know, I. I I'm not sure, you know, I've got several patients that have been in anterior deprogrammers without a sleep device. You know, it goes back to 20 years ago when I was doing dentistry. I saw a lady the other day, I made an NTI type device for 17 years ago. She's where she wearing it every night. She doesn't have any posterior teeth erupting or any bite changes or anything like that. So I, I don't know. Maybe I'm getting out of my league when I say that, but I think it's a whole lot less likely to happen in a sleep device when they would do that. So I wouldn't be as concerned. Uh, some a comment here about the respired dorsal. Yeah, the respired dorsal solves a couple of different problems because the fin is on the bottom. Uh, allergic to a somnodental appliance with a soft reliner, soft liner. I remade a dorsal with a thermocryl, and she still claims she's allergic. How common is this, and what do you do about it? Is she posturing for a refund? Uh, probably she is. What we do, this is a very good question on allergy type things. So what we do, when I made her a somnodent with a soft liner, for example, you can call somnodent and tell them that you want a button of the different types of material that are in the device that they, they just made you for the patient, okay? So you'll get three. You'll get the, the uh, stainless steel from the, uh, whatever you call it, the, the jack screw. You'll get the acrylic, and you'll get a button of the flex material, or whatever it is they call it. And what we do is we tape it on the inside of the patient's arm, and we tell them they have to come back in 24 hours. <clears throat> so... Pretty cool, you know. Um, you got to make sure they're not allergic to the tape that you put on there. But you know that makes it real easy. You know, if they don't, they don't have any reaction at all. Then you say, hey, look, you're just not allergic to this. You know that this is this is the way it is. You need to wear it, or you need to have something. So, okay, add vertical to a tap. We talked about you got to cut the plate off itself, and then build it up a little bit. I think we went over that sufficiently. How much, how comfortable are you delegating repairs to staff? Um, obviously, it depends on their skill level, as uh, Jody said, but uh, I've got an assistant that can do anything, and um, man, she's good. But why is that? Uh, number one, I probably got lucky. Number two, I took the time to show her how to do it in the beginning. 
And then I pay her pretty well. So she sticks around. So you got to have all three of those things. You got to have somebody who's teachable. And then when you teach them how, I like to teach the principles as well. This is what we're doing and why. So my assistant, who's been with me for two years now, she does a follow-up and she'll walk in and she'll say, Dr. Drake, uh, Jim Smith is here. He's wearing his device seven nights a week. He's having some issues with uh, bilateral uh, muscle issues, it sounds like. Um, but his snoring is better, his sleep quality is better, he's not waking up as many times at night, and um, his quality of life has improved significantly. So I, I'm going to go ahead and back him up, and I did talk to him about adding some vertical too or something like that. I mean, she, she understands that. She's heard me say it so many times. So I would say take the time to uh, teach your auxiliaries how to do this right, and then uh, utilize them every possible second of every possible day that you can. Okay, what else? Will this be recorded? Um, it will be uploaded to the U channel, YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, somebody said something about an occlusal spray. I don't know what that's about. Buffalo knife, nylon. Um, patients with multiple crown bridges using soft liner in your devices, any tips for tightening these up in the future? Man, I'm telling you, um, that flex material is comfortable. You know, I have about 10 dental devices, and um, if you don't have one, I think you should make one for yourself, and you should wear it for a while because you really get into uh, a groove with with how you you can relate to patients now. You know, yeah, I, I when I wore mine, it kind of made that too sore. I get that. I don't know what it is about that, but, you know, when you go through something the same as a patient does, they just like you more, so you do that. So if I think retention will be an issue with the patient, what does that mean? Shorter, straighter teeth, they never get flex. Never, never, ever. Because I don't want to do it over. You know, what are we going to do? Grind it all out like we did on that one guy and then um, add acrylic? Well, why don't we just use acrylic to start with? Or why don't we use thermocryl? So back up. Use your brain before you get started. Uh, ta -da, ta -da. So maxillary edentulous patients, you're going to have to tune in in two weeks, man. We are going to talk a whole lot about that. So I'm sorry my phone's ringing in the background. Um how do you take a bite of a patient with an anterior, an open anterior bite? Um, very carefully, uh, Paul. <laughs> so, you know, what we do a lot of times is we will take um, some of the bite registration material and we'll put it in the open bite and then we'll put the uh, Pro gauge in there, which is what I like to use, and we have them bite so that it, it actually just captures one side of that, you know, while we do that. And then we can have them move their jaw in that and then capture the back as we do that. So, you, you know, be creative. There is a way to do that. Um, uh, let me see what else. We're getting close to the end. Thank you guys for sticking with us. Uh, ta, ta, ta. how do you take uh, that we did that one muscle relaxant cheat sheet uh, gym pro uh, I have used that a few times Jacqueline uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, device to use if you're talking about um, for measuring bruxism and that kind of stuff I don't do it a whole lot um, I'm trying to talk those people into sending me one for free. Then I probably use it more just because I'm kind of cheap. Uh, the magazine is the Dental Sleep Medicine Insider. What do you do when the arm of the herbst is pinching the buccal mucosa? That's a tough one. Um, you know, people with very little cheek space on that side, man, that's a tough one. Most of the time... Uh, what I do, uh, Marianne, is I wish I had made a different dental device. <laughs> so, uh, you know, some people, it's just, you know, the Herbst 
if that front screw happens to sit exactly where the corner of their lip is, some people never get used to that thing. I mean, never, never, ever get used to it. So you got to be careful when you do that. Um, you know what, the, the, the buckle arm doing that, I think most of the time that the cheek gets pinched when you use a Herbst is because the two, the two, the upper and lower piece that are coming together like this is very sharp, like, like a scissor. So what I do is I take and I round those and I round it like that so that they're coming together so that the cheek can get stuck in there. But because it's round, it pinches the cheek out without actually pinching it and cutting it. So I think the majority of the time it's not the arm of the herps that's doing it as much as it is the acrylic that is on the occlusal surface. I hope that helps. Uh, how do elastics help? Uh, I missed the first few minutes. So elastics help keep some of the vertical component closed. Remember, if you think about what's happening is in sleep apnea is most of the time the lower jaw is falling down and back. You know, my kids took a video of me, they're home last Christmas, and what do I look like? You know, I'm laying there in a the chair, asleep, snoring, with my jaw hanging open and back. So remember, where your jaw in that position is completely different than your jaw in an open and forward position. So I want to hold your jaw out here like that, not here. And people go, yeah, but with my dorsal or my herbst, I can still move. But you move kind of like this. You're still not going back to this position where it is with nothing. So I talk about that. And so the elastics keep a little bit of the jaw closed. And they can help a little bit. Is unilateral pain a midline issue? Uh, Dr. Bill, I would say quite often it is. So look at the midlines. You know, we have a whole bunch of stuff in DS3 about how you can uh, take a better bite and look at that. So if you mark where the upper midline is on the lower teeth with a Sharpie, it will come off, I promise. Now you know exactly where to put your George gauge or your Pro gauge. We use a Pro gauge most of the time. So I know exactly where to take that. And as the patient moves forward, now I can do it. So take the upper midline, have the patient close their teeth, and you make a mark on the lower teeth exactly where the upper midline is. That may be a whole tooth over one way or the other, but that's where they bite together. Then I take the bite registration material, I put it on the top, and I center the top one right where I want it, and I just have them close into the bottom one forward. I let that set up. I got to use another tip. Okay, so it costs you an extra dollar. Put another tip on your bite registration material. Now put it on the bottom and have them close exactly into that, and I've got my midlines. It's a perfect way to do the bites. Uh, will tripod in a herb to ease or worsen joint pain? That's a really good question. Most of the herps I make are uh, anterior openings. So if I'm going to use a device that has adjustments on the side, then most of the time I want an anterior opening. I want to be careful about adding vertical. So I want more vertical if I have a big tongue and if I have compromised nasal patency issues, okay? If that same patient has TMJ issues, then I want less vertical. And if you're lucky enough to have that be your first patient, then you're, you're, you're in a tough spot. You know, what do you do? I would probably start with less vertical because that's going to, that's going to create less pain. Less pain means patients will wear your dental device and now we can work them into something else. All right. Have I used the three shape trio scanner? I had it demoed in my office and it looked wonderful. Um, I actually used the CareStream. Um, 
I wish all of these companies would send me a scanner for free, and then I would talk really good about all of them. Um, all of the ones I use I like uh, uh, that I have used in the past, so yeah. Um, if you're using it and you got some feedback, send me an email, richard at dentalsleepsolutions.com, and let me know. Uh, that's probably a good topic for a webinar in the not-too-distant future would simply be um, using scanners, how we can use them in dental sleep medicine and what we can do, because I've been doing that for three or four years now. We very seldom take an impression anymore. Okay. Brooke told me he can tell me he hates using one. Uh, I'm with you on that one, Brooke. So um, you got to have the the problem seems to be in the software for the full arch versions is what I've found. So some people seem to have that figured out a little bit better than other people. If you will email me separately, I'm happy to talk to you about that in person. <coughs> All right. I got to go take the dog for a walk. Let's see if we got most of these done. I think. Thank you for your compliments on this. We try hard. So everybody out there, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you got something out of this. Be sure and tune in next two weeks from now where we're going to talk about a couple of different things. So I'm signing off now, guys. Have a good night and uh, get some patients in out there and start treating their sleep apnea.